For the first time in the history of humanity, half of the world's population is now living in cities. And in 50 years from now, cities will be home to 70% of all human beings. They will have 7 billion mouths to feed and will face an immense challenge in terms of food supply. As they demand more and more to eat, cities are continuing to spread. They are gobbling up the resources from the countryside and spitting out pollution and waste. Given their current behavior, cities are the biggest parasites ever hosted by the Earth. This system, which has lasted for millennia, is now at the end of its tether. But what if farming, relegated for so long to the depths of the countryside, were to make a return to the cities? This idea has been gathering pace for several years. In greenhouses and laboratories around the world, scientists are trying to work out how to produce large quantities of food everywhere, in all seasons, and in particular, in a sustainable manner. To feed three quarters of the human population, urban agriculture will have to take on a radically new form. And this is what the inventors of tomorrow's agricultural towers are promising. Vertical urban farms. To fill supermarket shelves, cities depend entirely on the countryside. Everything that we eat today in cities comes from the land, and the fields have become gigantic open-air food factories. Agriculture has undergone its biggest mutation since prehistory with the help of machines, fertilizers, and pesticides. The demand is for ever more food, ever faster production, and ever lower costs. But we cannot go on indefinitely increasing yields without harming the resources which are already overexploited. In New York, Dixon de Pommier, professor of environmental sciences at the Columbia University, has spent the last 20 years trying to bring the world out of the impasse in which it is caught up. There are many people who would suggest very strongly that uh, things can go on as normal. So it depends on how you define normal. Normal, in this case, is not good normal. It's bad normal. We're going to run out of resources <laughs> eventually. And when we run out of resources, we have collapse as the result. So cities become extinct. It could happen to Paris, to London, to New York City, to Chicago. If you become too large to um, supply enough to keep everybody happy, then you will get a collapse of the system. Something needs to change in our planet's food system. Every second around the world, 40 tons of food are discarded. That is one-third of global agricultural production that rots every year during transportation. From New York to Shanghai, people are coming to the same conclusion. The problem is no longer producing more, but producing better. In reality, Global agricultural production is greater than consumption. So why are there so many people who still aren't getting enough to eat? There are two reasons. The first is that agricultural resources aren't balanced. In some places, too much food is being produced. And in others, there's not enough to go around. So there are still many populations suffering from famine around the world. The second reason is waste. In a country as big as China, the amount of food being wasted is huge. How can we reduce this phenomenon and rebalance global production? Urban agriculture is a strategic solution to these two problems. People became disconnected from the natural world. Today, we realize those disconnects, and we can see what it causes. It causes problems of transporting the food supply to the city. It pollutes the air, it pollutes the water, it pollutes the land. And we now have a movement afoot, I think, a very strong movement in most cities, not in everybody, but in, in a large group in, mo in most cities, to, to move agriculture back into the city, to put the food supply close to where people live, to allow them to reconnect with the processes which allowed you to develop to begin with. All around the world, when cities and countryside come together, it makes for a show. 
and the audience provides the proof. We want to bring food production as close as possible to where food is eaten. But creating fields amidst concrete spaces isn't as easy as all that. Where can we find the room to grow fruit, vegetables, and grains? Do we need to redesign our boulevards to make way for tractors? Fortunately for local residents, there are some alternatives. In Montreal, the Lufa farm is located on a roof just 10 minutes from downtown. It proves that it is possible to be both local and profitable. The idea was to build a farm that would be truly close to the consumers in the center of the city and which would allow us to harvest food for eating that same day. We are very proud that the majority of our vegetables travel fewer than eight miles to consumers' plates. The harvest starts at 5 a.m., and only vegetables needed that day are picked. It's a way of reducing food waste to almost zero. The food chain is normally very long. Our food often has to travel huge distances to reach us. Tomatoes, for example, take weeks, either in cargo ships, trains or depots, before reaching your plate. So ripening happens on the way. And that is a big difference with the varieties you find here in the greenhouse, compared to what you find on grocer shelves. Products selected for their quality not for their capacity to stand up to transportation or being able to travel sometimes thousands of miles. Our vegetables are picked each morning, which means they're harvested when ripe, when their sugar content is highest and their taste is at its best. The Lufa farm opened in 2011 and is far from being an isolated initiative. Around big cities, local producers are getting organized and coming direct to urban consumers. The, the appetite for fresh produce is, is growing tremendously, not just in New York City, but all across uh, North America and in, in the EU as well. And local food is growing in popularity as well because consumers, they're concerned about knowing where the food is produced and how it's produced. New York has been a real innovator in rooftop farming and uh, we have lots of different examples of different types of rooftop farms open-air farms, uh, greenhouses on rooftops. And it's partly because we have entrepreneurs who have gotten excited by the idea. Uh, we also have about 3,000 acres of flat rooftop space on buildings that can actually hold the weight of a farm. Spearheading this global trend, the former industrial neighborhood of Brooklyn in New York is rapidly becoming the biggest urban vegetable garden on the planet. The irony is that in the 19th century, Brooklyn was a market garden area at the gates to the city. A few years after agriculture was driven out by industry, it is returning via the rooftops. The proponents of urban agriculture propose a low cost, green, sustainable and convivial city. But rooftop cultivation will never be able to respond to the immense food requirements of tomorrow's cities. <laughs> rooftop farms are a great uh, first step for vertical farming. They are urban agriculture and they solve one of the large problems which is locality. Rooftop farms take traditional agriculture and place it on the roof in the city. So the distance problem has been solved but the multiplication and the large-scale crop production needs to be the next step and that is where the vertical farm comes in. Passing to the next level is all well and good but how? Nobody dared imagine cities capable of producing enough to feed the seven billion city dwellers of the year 2050. Nobody, that is, until Dixon de Pommier got hold of the idea. So the idea was to grow food on rooftops first and move it into the building. What I did to begin with was uh, use a classroom as the way of introducing a new idea. And you know, the students, and I didn't have many students, but they all said, you can do that? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> How would I know? I've never done that before. But, but it's, it's interesting to imagine doing it. In the quiet of his classroom, Dixon de Pommier is now offering his students a radical and fascinating hypothesis on the scale of tomorrow's megacities, towers capable of feeding 30,000 people for an entire year. If you take a farm 
that's horizontal and make it into a large apartment like for plants, I call that vertical farming. For one acre of indoor farm, it's equivalent to 10 acres of outdoor farm. So you've compressed and uh, maximized efficiency by growing things in closed spaces within these tall structures. Today we use the size of South America to grow food for 7.2 billion people. We can accomplish the same thing with one-tenth the use of land if we were to farm inside the city. One-tenth. Dixon de Pommier is convinced that his vertical farms will soon be part of our daily landscape. For a long time, we've been able to build skyscrapers for living and working in cities. So why can't agriculture have a turn at going vertical? We've grown our food, some of it, in greenhouses. And everybody knows what a greenhouse is. So that's not the mystery. What is the mystery? The mystery is making it dense enough in production to supply large populations. So what's the secret? Well, it's like to comparing a single dwelling house to an apartment. So we do the same thing with our plants and with our crops, and we've reinvented farming just like we reinvented city life. In 2005, after three years of study and research, the idea was finally mature, but was still restricted to the small world of students and a few innovation-greedy web users. It was now time to introduce it to the wider world and give its inventors some international notoriety. What was really missing to give impact to the audience was um, having the, the look of the vertical farm a little bit Hollywood. Um, it had to be like a billboard. You had to look at it and say, that looks like a vertical farm. So I went to, to verticalfarm.com and uh, I read kind of the thesis that they had put on there. And Dr. Dixon Despommier, he had his students put together a lot of information. Uh, so I sat and read and I thought, you know, what would a vertical farm look like? We have to have a lot of surface. Uh, there has to be a way of watering. Uh, there has to be a way of draining. Uh, it has to be tall, it has to look like a high rise. So uh, in a single day, uh, literally like a 10 hour day, I sat and sketched and drew and, and built in 3D uh, this form of vertical farm. Chris Jacobs' images, which were published in July 2007 in New York Magazine, were immediately picked up by the international media. When this was all going on and, and publications were calling, like, I mean, I would get calls at least three times a day for, from publications in Germany and, and China and France and, and India and Dubai. And I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was like every single day, I'm just like giving stuff out to people. And here is the university professor who was suddenly named the father of the farms of the future. Today, Dixon de Pommier is invited all around the world to preach his message and recruit new disciples. Well, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm very excited to tell you about some of the developments that have happened to this idea that started 11 years ago in a classroom. Eight years ago, there was only one of these designs, and today we can find 6.7 million website hits for that term. These were people who picked this idea up, people catching this bug in their head, going home, and they couldn't sleep. There's a lot of them out there, and more that I don't know about coming up. Look at all these drawings. Look at the incredible detail of this. A new generation of architects has taken up the concept to make it an incredible terrain for futuristic experimentation. But is it a rational anticipation of the near future, or a new utopic delirium? The tower designed by Blake Kurasek for the city of Chicago has 120 production floors, rising up to a height of 150 meters. I wanted the, the tower to be tall to sort of exaggerate the fact that it's a vertical farm. And because it was an example of 
agriculture in an urban environment, it needed to be a relatively large tower. And it was more of like a showcase or a showpiece to really show off this technology and this crop production style in a city like Chicago, which is known for its architecture. This is a zoomed in shot of the hydroponic facility inside the vertical farm. This is a farmer of the future. It sounds like science fiction, but actually all of these technologies exist today. Uh, there's been a lot of research in them. Uh, they just haven't really been fully implemented to their full effect. Indeed, we are still a long way off growing tomatoes on the tops of skyscrapers. And vertical farms are, as yet, still only theoretical. But piling floor upon floor to give more surface area than a simple roof will create a slight problem in terms of weight. Traditionally, when you grow crops, you use soil on the ground. And the weight of the soil in a skyscraper would be um, overwhelming to the structure. So the technologies that I used in my vertical farm is essentially a nutrient-rich film of water where the nutrients are dissolved in water and then they are run through a tube and the plants are placed in a medium so that the roots receive the nutrients through the tube. This modern farming technique is called hydroponics. It is the miracle recipe for tomorrow's vertical farms, but the principles of hydroponics have been around for some years now. The very first hydroponic garden that I know of was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. <laughs> many, many years ago. I am not old enough to remember that. And it was a wonder of the world. It was one of the seven wonders of the world, in fact, to see these plants growing not in soil. I guess it occurred to somebody, well, maybe every plant can do this. We just haven't given them the chance. And it turned out to be correct. And the idea did not disappear with that glorious ancient city. Indeed, during the 1980s, one major American institution studied the idea very closely. Its hanging gardens perhaps weren't the seventh wonder of the world, but farmers in white coats managed to grow wheat, salads, and all kinds of fresh vegetables, including the raw materials for the french fries of the future, all without a single gram of earth. Except that these potatoes weren't growing on earth, but in space. Because this American institution is nothing less than NASA. The American Aerospace Agency saw hydroponics as a way to feed the astronauts who will one day head for Mars. And the quality of the menus here gets a lot of attention. Hi, I'm Michelle Prachonik, and I'm the advanced food lead here at Johnson Space Center. And once we go to Mars, we're going to be able to start growing foods in chambers hydroponically. And we're going to start by growing the fruits and vegetables so that the crew can have fresh, colorful, crunchy salads that will include the tomatoes, carrots, bell peppers, as well as the greens like lettuce and spinach. The application of the technology on Earth is substantial. And I think, uh, Michelle, we can apply this to stuff on Earth as well. We can certainly apply it to, to on Earth. Both the hydroponic growing of crops going to be working on Earth as well as on Mars. On Earth, the progress of hydroponics has gradually seduced the food industry. Today, a new generation of suspended greenhouses is colonizing the roofs of New York for large-scale, off-the-ground food production in the middle of a city. Hydroponics uses about 10% of the water that traditional agriculture uses. So a farm outside is having to constantly irrigate um, or depend on uh, rain, whereas we use very, very little water to accomplish even better growth. Hydroponics saves on water, which is set to become one of the most sought-after resources of the next century, and it also enables increased production on a spectacular scale. Hydroponics is, is wonderful because it allows you to crowd a, a large amount of plants into a small space. Our projection is that we'll, we'll be hitting about 100,000 pounds of produce a year, and, and that's great for the smallest of space that we have here. It's only 6,000 square feet. The way this system works is that we set, we set the, the nutrient level and the pH level of the water to whatever we want it to be for the specific crop, in this case lettuce, and then as needed, it sucks nutrients and acid automatically. The water is pumped up to these individual channels via these small black pipes. This is a water and nutrient concentrate mixture. The plants don't use very much of it um, at a time, and so we're able to constantly recycle the water um, through this closed loop system. Um, 
it's, it's very simple, but very effective, very conservative. Each plant is individually fed according to its size or growth phase. This is an a la carte menu delivered straight to the roots by an attentive staff. Here are the chemicals. They're all pure. I put this much, this much, this much, this much into water, stir it up, feed it to the plants. The plant goes, hmm, thank you very much. And then it also absorbs what we need to without extras. No heavy metals, no pesticides, no herbicides. Plants are grown under ideal conditions, meaning that you get many more crops per year that way than you would if you planted it outdoors, because we can control everything. The advent of some technologies, the advent of computer monitoring systems so that the solutions maintain a, a near constant level so that the plants get optimum benefit from, the ability for the roof to open and close and ventilate, uh, the ability for us to incorporate under bench heating so that the root balls stay warm. You know, all of these things provide the plant with the optimum growing environment. And what that does then is give us the opportunity to grow 15 to 20 times what people in a dirt-based farm can do using less than 10% of the water. And naturally, no pesticides are used. To manage intruders that manage to slip through the technological net, they use an integrated anti-parasitic approach, which, in other words, involves tried and tested old-fashioned methods. Well, I'm just distributing all these ladybugs throughout the greenhouse, and uh, they help us control the aphid population. So they're very beneficial to us because the aphids, they eat our crops. And so the ladybugs, they eat the aphids. And so uh, we like them, they help us out. Every week we release around 30,000 ladybugs. It doesn't use any chemicals, it's just all very natural. Using ladybugs to fight parasites is impossible in the open fields. The pests are too many, and only pesticides can put a complete stop to invasions. However, in greenhouses, in a completely protected environment, one can obtain abundant crops without the use of chemicals. The vegetables are thus healthier, but cannot be classed as organic, as the standards that define this status require the plants to be grown in earth. No more earth, almost no water. Dixon de Pommier's dream now seems to be within reach. In today's greenhouses, the upper floors are used to grow what will be sold in a few hours' time down below. These pioneers of New York agriculture are already operating like small-scale, mini vertical farms. There's just an extra leap that needs to happen where we actually need to combine the hydroponics on multiple levels in a skyscraper, and that is the next step. What you're looking at is an evolution of an idea. So the, the idea starts as, oh yeah, we should grow food in the city, let's use a rooftop because it's convenient and easy. So you get these tubs, you fill it with soil, you put the, uh, okay, fine. Well, that's not enough. Let, I tell you what, let's cover it over and make it a greenhouse. And, and that's not enough. Um, okay, then I tell you what, let's make it two stories tall. That's a vertical farm. Then two, three, four, five stories. Who knows how tall you can build them? It's up to the architects and engineers to tell us that. Architects around the world have used scientific advances to create buildings that are ever more exuberant and ever more spectacular. In London, or Zagreb, by the sea or inland, we celebrate the birth of a new urban civilization that is both environmentally friendly and technologically advanced. Architects have always been inspired by the world of science and therefore inspired by de Pommier. We wanted to reinvent the scenarios of tomorrow by using contemporary sciences to try and motivate and trigger creativity. We must urgently reinvent the way we improve quality of life through the integration of nature and the reintegration of agricultural cycles. Since then, around the world, in emerging countries, whether in Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, in North Africa, in South America, there is a growing global appetite for vertical farms. The aim of vertical agriculture is to save land. There is also the problem of city-states, such as Singapore, Monaco or Luxembourg, which are tiny and very dense countries, limited in terms of their land and thus dependent on neighboring countries. These countries could be the first to construct the vertical farms of tomorrow. 
Singapore. Here, vertical farms are not a question, rather an answer. Stuck between the giants of Indonesia and Malaysia, this island state covers a surface area that is scarcely larger than the Bay of Mont Saint-Michel. To feed over 5 million inhabitants, the island can only spare 2% of its territory for agriculture, and virtually all foodstuffs are imported from abroad. You know, Singapore is a very small country. We don't have a lot of land for farming. If I have to import vegetables from a neighborhood country, say, for example, from Malaysia, you would think about 24 hours. You go to Thailand, you take three days. You go to Indonesia sometime, you take one week. So imagine on, of highly perishable products like vegetable. You know, importing vegetable from overseas sometimes, it can be a challenge to us. In the city state like Singapore, I think we don't have farmland like in France or in America or in Europe. So I think the only way is actually look at high-tech way of farming method. Using very little land, but you are able to achieve a higher yield of production. Reconciling economic development with sustainable development here isn't a question of principle, rather one of survival. Encouraged by a particularly dynamic Ministry of Agriculture, today's young entrepreneurs are gambling on intensive methods whilst economizing on the island's scarcest resource, space. We just planted this about a week ago. The growth rate is quite phenomenal. What is the footprint that you're taking up in a, in an A-frame like that? I think this is a six meters by, I think, one and a half. So how many plants are in a frame like that? Can, can you grow? When space on the ground is limited, people start to look up and yields take off. For now, the clientele is limited to top-of-the-range restaurants and the experiment is on a very small scale. But the authorities want to take it further. Agrarian farming has been in Singapore since the 1980s, where AVA spearheaded the movement to agrotechnology, um, where modern science and technology is used to develop the vertical system that is able to produce more with less land and water. After 30 years of investment in urban agriculture, the Singaporeans' bet has paid off. In October 2012, engineer Jack Ng equipped his urban farm with the world's first system for vertical production. Finally, the technology has moved from a prototype phase to a commercial one. The main aim of this A-shaped vertical system is to lift up the plants so they receive light for the production of chlorophyll and bring them down to hydrate them. At the same time, the system rests the plants so they don't spend too much time in the sun, which would burn them. The Ago Grow system developed by Jack Ng is based on an ingenious hydraulic shelving system for the plants that is over six meters high and doesn't require extensive floor space. The plants are rotated, so each one enjoys the same amount of water and light throughout the day. Traditional ground-based cultivation requires 400 kilograms of water to produce one kilo of vegetables. However, our latest records show that with our system, you need just 12 kilograms of water for one kilo of vegetables. That's how we can earn our money. With his 10-meter-high greenhouses, Jack Ng has proved that it is now possible to farm vertically, and Sky Green's products are widely appreciated by Singaporean consumers. For just a few cents more, they reassure customers who have unpleasant memories of the food scandals in the 1990s. While imported products are regarded with a great deal of suspicion, local products are obviously fresh, healthy, and safe. We started selling sky green vegetables since April 2012. That was almost two years ago. And we were the first that vegetable has been selling well and we have been achieving double GD growth month on month. So the response has been good. In actual fact, the farm producer actually, they couldn't cope up with our demand. So now they have in the process of increasing more tower so they can supply more vegetable to our store. They can actually increase the production 
according to our needs. And we can get it within six hours. We can talk to them and say, look, I need more vegetable. They can respond faster versus then I have to import from overseas. The demand is there, the technology is available, and vertical farming is starting to prove its economic efficiency in Singapore. But Singapore enjoys year-round sunshine, a free resource that is indispensable for this type of production, and which is cruelly lacking in northern hemisphere countries. To be able to produce year-round, even in the depths of winter, vertical farms are obliged to use artificial light, and this weighs heavily on the cost. Given the current situation, Dixon de Pommier risks bringing to life energy-devouring monsters. You have to use a lot of lights, you have to use a lot of electricity. The issue is too expensive, not efficient enough. So, you know, you wait for a miracle, and we got one from the Philips Lighting Company. Philips announced in February of 2013 a 68% efficient light. So it went from 50 lumens per kilowatt hour to 200 lumens per kilowatt hour. That's all we needed. These new lamps, capable of producing four times as much light from the same amount of electricity, use one of today's booming technologies, electroluminescent diodes, or LEDs. By 2020, it is estimated that LEDs will cover 70% of the world's lighting needs. They are now starting to be used in food production. If their benefits are proven, they could be a key solution in the construction of vertical farms. At the University of Van Ganang in the Netherlands, Professor Tom Dweck is one of the pioneers of this new research into LEDs. LEDs is a system, a light system that's been used for quite some time. We see it most often in your house, uh, in car lights, in billboard lights, and the last number of years we've been seeing it more frequently in greenhouses as well to light plants. That's because LEDs are much more efficient than, uh, than the conventional high-pressure sodium lights, and also because you can place them anywhere in your greenhouse. You can place them right close to your plant, which you cannot with another type of light that uh, gives a lot more heat and would burn your plant, essentially. Unlike traditional lighting solutions, LEDs can be fine-tuned in terms of the intensity and color of light touching each leaf. Three years ago, the use of LEDs was still experimental, but now they are starting to seduce innovative growers like Mark Dillison in the south of Holland, who has seen the rhythm of his seasons turned on its head. Normally, uh, springtime is the fast-growing period of the year, uh, from seeding till, uh, till uh, that the pl lettuce plant is something like this big, seven, 10 centimeters. Uh, normally, that's 30 days. In wintertime, outside, uh, with, when there's not, a, not much light and the days are really short, to get a plant that is 10 centimeters high takes 100 days. Within the LED rooms, we have cut that back, similar to springtime. So, in a way, we have always spring in the LED rooms. Imagine you in springtime in the sun, uh, you're feeling happy, that's the same with the plant. It took us four years to build an LED room with seven stories, uh, starting from scratch. We had to do a, a lot of research, so that was quite a big challenge. Uh, in total, in the four cells that we have, on an average, it's around one million plants that are in here. With Christmas, we had a lot of sales and uh, we just turn a bit on the, on the, on the buttons for uh, higher temperature or longer light. Thanks to LEDs, you can now change season at the touch of a button. Perhaps soon, we'll be able to use this technology to grow any plant anywhere around the world. The idea is now being taken very seriously. At the German Space Agency in Bremen, Daniel Schubert has developed a model for a vertical farm. To him, the rapid progress made in the field of LEDs is finally allowing people to imagine turning theory into practice. We wanted to design a production building that could be constructed in a megalopolis such as Beijing, Tokyo or New York in order to grow food. 
Our vertical farm produces 13 tons of fresh food every day, which is sold in the supermarket. Until now, the cost of LED lighting has been prohibitive. If you look at the price of LEDs over the last few years, it was practically unimaginable to light big plantations that way. But since LEDs have become much less expensive, it is now possible to use them on a big scale in a vertical farm. In practice, we are experiencing the same evolutions as seen with computer processors or chips that become faster and more efficient every year. Paradoxically, the most important technical solution for vertical farms has come from the flattest land in the world, the Netherlands. In the greenhouses of Rotterdam, new artificial suns are already starting to rise. The LED lamp that you here see, the hang fast on this. The LEDs you see here are tied up at this height. One row is placed at a meter 90, and the next one 50 centimeters above. The plant keeps growing two or three meters, and the lamps are here, inside the plant. With LED lighting, we get more plants per meter, and thus more tomatoes. This gives us better yields, but also lower costs. Our production is 20 to 25 percent greater, 25 percent more than with a traditional lighting system. These results are already spectacular, but for researchers, this is just the beginning, because the ability to control light is opening up a raft of new opportunities to agronomists. We use uh, different colors of, uh, of light, and we try and, and uh, our research is directed to making a light recipe to see which of the light combinations in space and time are the most effective for growing the plants in the way we need that. Um, for example, blue light will basically keep your plant shorter. Red light will make the most amount, most uh, uh, profit from the energy you put into it. And far red light will also affect the, the, the uh, growth, the elongation, the, the length of your plant among other things. Uh, different combinations can also influence the time of flowering, uh, the size of, the, of, your, of your leaves or fruits. Those are things we play around with to find the best uh, light recipe to make our uh, crops grow the way we want them to. A clever little cook-up to create a kind of ideal sunshine, a made-to-measure internal sunshine. Pink light is made because uh, the light colors that are usually used with LEDs are a red and a, a smaller portion of blue, and they're combined to make pink light. Pink light in a greenhouse is, uh, is a nice, it's almost a disco light. We haven't envisaged things being this way, but perhaps the farms of the future will indeed resemble giant discotheques. But what kinds of food are being produced by these disco farms that look like UFOs? Encouraged by their initial success, scientists are continuing their research, and their objective right now is to create the perfect fruit and the ultimate plant. Now, a lot of people think, or might think, that a healthy tomato will only grow in the sunlight, outdoors, in the ground. Well, that's not the case. Uh, if you know the kind of nutrients the, the tomato outside gets, we can supply that inside. You have a, a nicer climate for the plant and we can grow it year round. So we can grow a very healthy, uh, well-producing plant indoors just as well and even better than outdoors. By regulating the light spectrum, we can precisely define the flavor of the plant, the flavor of the vegetable or that of the fruit. For example, we are able to make a Dutch tomato, but also one from a garden in southern Italy. Could a pink LED-based sun give as much flavor to the fruit as real Italian sunshine? For consumers, it's still a little hard to swallow, except that for Dutch producers, terroir is no longer really an issue. All our tomatoes are exported to Italy. 90 to 95 percent of our tomatoes go to that country. 
doing better than Mother Nature, creating fruit to one's own standards and in infinite quantities that previously one was happy to gather from the tree or the branch, has modern science really outstripped the imaginations of science fiction authors? Not quite, because for now nothing has completely replaced natural light. Even the most modern greenhouses use as much natural sunshine as possible, and LEDs only supply a useful addition at certain times or during certain seasons. But in a vertical farm, the stacked layers would prevent sunlight from entering the greenhouses. The solution is therefore to be completely cut off from the outside world. At the German Space Agency, nobody is put off by this sci-fi scenario, and they are preparing to embark on the final stage, the creation of a completely artificial environment. By removing plants from their natural system and creating a totally artificial environment, we can optimize plant growth. We are going much further than hydroponics. We are talking about controlled environment agriculture, or CEA. With CEA technologies, we are able to completely control the environmental conditions for the plants. We are able to precisely manage the level of carbon dioxide in the air, the temperature and the ambient humidity. The light spectrum is precisely controlled, as is the composition of nutrients for the roots. The conclusion of the analysis is that, on an agronomic level, the hypothesis of vertical farms is perfectly credible, apart from one thing. From a technical point of view, vertical farms are definitely now feasible. The question is, however, are they viable from an economic point of view? That's why we carried out detailed market analysis, a precise analysis of the cost of a vertical farm. The result is that we can produce fresh food for 12 euros per kilo. Of course, that's not commercially feasible, at least not in our region, in our society where everything has to be cheap. At that price, one can of course understand why vertical farms are still virtual here. For now, they are prohibitively expensive technological gems. But there is a country where towers are springing up like mushrooms, and where one day, mushrooms themselves could be grown inside them. Shanghai is a symbol of new Chinese power and holds all the records for growth. The Pearl of the Orient is no longer hiding its ambitions to become the New York of the third millennium. In this new Manhattan, some people are ready to pay a great deal for high quality food. The plants are displayed like works of art and fresh products are sold like luxury goods. Uh, we have to make this a lifestyle product. We're not selling just food. Um, we have uh, Wagyu beef, we have uh, 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 Spanish Iberico ham. Uh, why not? We have vertical uh, vegetables. It, it is a brand name product, it's a lifestyle product. It's not just feeding food to people uh, to satisfy their hunger, but it's a certain value. Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, uh, Guangzhou, uh, these cities, they have uh, the means to uh, purchase uh, better quality food, so I think these four cities are natural. Dixon de Pommier dreamt of a solution for the whole of humanity, but today his vertical farms would serve only a privileged few. But you would never feed seven billion citizens with luxury products. How long will we have to wait before these technologies are finally accessible to all? Three quarters of the most populated cities in the world are in Asia, and for them time is running out. These Asian megalopolises are firmly committed to taking the path to vertical farms because here, more than elsewhere, there is absolutely no time to waste. Shanghai is faced with a big problem. There's no more farm labor available. Actually, there is, but the people aged 70 or more can no longer move around and have no training. These kinds of plant factories could be created on an industrial scale in the future, and then agriculture would become an industrial process that might attract young people and encourage them to work in agriculture. These days, young people no longer want to get into agriculture because it's too tough. But if you could construct factories like this, even young people will want to get involved. To seduce the youth and produce in a controlled environment, the fields are being transformed into vegetable factories, 
cutting-edge technologies are becoming widespread in vegetable gardens, and Dutch professors are coming to share the latest innovations. This is an equal mixture of the color red and the color blue, but to our eyes, it comes out violet, actually pink. The lesson has been learned, bar a few details, and the techno farmers have already traded in their tractors for computers. In their agricultural factories, they want to find out as quickly as possible how to mass produce food, much like how cars and TVs are made. I'm very keen to create plant factories in the heart of each community. We would produce fruit and vegetables for the local population. Each neighborhood would have a guaranteed fixed amount. The population would be happier and it would see how things grow. They'll say, oh, is that how it works? Is that so? Seeing what one is going to eat makes one happier. Moreover, it would be a factory for each community. I really think that building a vegetable factory for a specific community would be very reassuring. And there would be no pollution. It's much better like that. In China, a realistic vision of vertical farms is emerging, although it differs from those great monolithic towers imagined in New York 15 years ago. Using existing technologies, they could already feed the population of a neighborhood and eventually an entire town. Using fewer robots, they could provide employment for the local population. And by connecting to existing public facilities, they could take their energy from recycling waste and supply organic fertilizer to farmers in the countryside. Vertical agriculture isn't seeking to replace traditional agriculture. By providing practical solutions for local problems, it has its own place beside rural agriculture in the service of tomorrow's cities. I think it has a promising future. While the process is now only in its infancy, it has a big future ahead of it. In a country undergoing great change like China, the opportunities are excellent. There's a lot of potential for future development in terms of production techniques and sustainable ways that the West, which is the dominant model today, has yet to develop. The vertical farms we imagine today for major Chinese cities aren't just giant greenhouses stuffed with technology. For Tom Boshout, the creator of a sustainable development plan for the city of Shanghai, vertical farms must do more than simply resolve the food issue. They must be part of the invention of a new style of urban life. The towers are just one component of a much, uh, I would say, richer system that embeds itself into the city fabric. In a way, there are flowers that grow out of the soil uh, of the particular area. They are not thought from the outside and dumped on location, but they extract what is necessary for that particular location, and uh, they can have a variety of different uses, and, uh, and, and that's what makes it exciting. It's a unique tower for a unique place. The Lilong districts harbor a lot of the rural immigrants uh, that have come from uh, all around China, basically, and they moved into the city. So these people that uh, have very little means, but they are skilled in agricultural uh, production. So if you actually build uh, the facilities uh, which rely on human labor to uh, produce this food, then that's a very strong economic reason to actually produce food using these, uh, these rural migrants. So this is a skyscraper that is specifically designed to be able to grow a large variety of different food, um, which then has the economical capability to actually be that food producer for the city at large. And at the same time, filter water, cycle waste, provide employment to uh, local residents. So you basically get a tower that, amongst other things, produces plants, but it does so many more. The ideal conclusion would be that food production, the activity of the population, like the system for waste treatment, would be a complete ecosystem 
As such, a new artificial ecosystem is a possibility and would be really very exciting. Transforming the giant parasites that are the cities of today into a virtuous ecosystem will take time, but the revolution has begun. By farming on roofs, sidewalks, and soon in towers, a new and complete ecosystem is being sketched out where each solution has a role to play. In architects' offices the world over, they are creating the landscapes of tomorrow, because if the marriage of agriculture with our cities is to be a success, neither will come out of it unscathed. From this union that goes against nature, a different kind of agriculture will inevitably be born in a whole new kind of city. In public spaces and private places, inside buildings and on their facades, in the greenhouses of today, as in the vertical farms of tomorrow, the city is there to be reinvented, and we have the means to do it. For the first time in the history of humans, we have enough knowledge to become ecologically equivalent in our built environment as the rainforest is in its own environment. And that's the big future for cities, is to start incorporating those changes into its infrastructure and to become self-sufficient.